Hi, my name is Phoebe Lockhurst and I'm a senior commissioning editor at the Sunday Times magazine. I'm delighted to be here at COGX today to moderate this panel from sports star to saving the world. And I have with me today two sports stars who are hoping to do just that. This is Jamie Farndale, Scotland Sevens captain and Scottish Rugby Sustainability Ambassador. Jamie is studying for a master's course in sustainability at Cambridge University and is currently shortlisted as the Athlete Ambassador at their Sustainability Awards. Jamie, it's a pleasure to have you. On the screen, we have Mathieu Flamini, a former footballer for Arsenal, AC Milan and the French national team, and now the CEO of GF Biochemicals, which is formulating ingredients from bio-waste with the ambition of replacing harmful forever chemicals found in everyday household products. Mathieu, it's lovely to have you here too. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Jamie and Mathieu about how the lessons that they learned on the field have shaped the projects that they've pursued off it. So, Jamie, let's start with you. When did you fall in love with rugby? <laughs> uh, I, I, I kind of hated rugby when I first started it. I, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't really come from a, a rugby family and everyone else had started playing a lot earlier than me. Uh, and I was in junior school put into the third team, uh, which I didn't like, and I went away and trained. Um, so maybe I've proved, <laughs> proved my junior school teachers wrong with a 13-year career. <laughs> um, but no, I, I fell in love, love with rugby along the way. Um, the sport, but more just, just the people that you meet, the places you go, these massive highs, but also these pretty low lows um, that you experience, and all together as a team, um, yeah, I've, I've, I'm very lucky to have done what I've done for so long. And what are some of the achievements that you're proudest of in that 13-year career? Um, well, I got married this summer. Uh, my wife's actually in the crowd. Um, she's just graduated as a clinical um, psychologist, um, so very proud of that. Very good. Um, but on the sporting pitch, uh, yeah, I mentioned those highs, um, and there are a few that, I pe that you can sort of pick out. I've captained my country to Commonwealth Games, World Cups, um, very lucky to have, have won a World Series um, back to back in Twickenham, where you know Scotland hadn't been past a semi final, and um, in the second year especially, we beat a New Zealand team. I think the only Scottish team in the history of rugby to have beaten <laughs> a New Zealand team. Um, so yeah, you, you get these extreme highs. It, it comes with the lows, but the, the feeling you get when when you experience success like that, there's there's just nothing that matches it. And Mattia, you had a career at the top level of football for 20 years. What were some of the highlights? I mean, it's difficult to, to pick maybe one moment. I mean, maybe to say also that for me, football has been a love story. I grew up in the city of Marseille and, and the football club of the Olympic of Marseille is very part of the, of the city, the club which is very much loved by many people. So since a very early age, I think I started my career. I mean, I started playing football at the age of five. And as you said, I've been extremely lucky to, one, live a dream, which has lasted for nearly 20 years. And two, if I have to pick up one of the most important things to drink that career, I will say it's like to last for such a long period of time because being able to reach the top level is, is hard, I have to be honest with you. But for me, I think what has been the hardest is to last for such a long time at the top level. So maybe I won't pick up like one, one moment, but just having said that, I started my career in Marseille, reached uh, the, at the age of 19, you know, the club of Arsenal where I played a long time and then also like enjoy some quality time in, in Italy. So. I think like uh, for me, the, what I want to remember is like not being able to, to last for, for such a long time. And can you talk to me a bit about the kind of qualities that it takes to succeed at the highest level of sport? Jamie, first of all, kind of mental qualities, the resilience. Yeah, I think consistency of, of effort is, is definitely up there. I think dealing with failure is something that sport I'm not sure whether sport teaches you it or whether you know you only survive in sport if you can deal with it. But the the, the feedback in sport is very short. If you fail, it's very obvious. It's in front of a lot of people, so you've got to be able to deal with that and learn from that. Um, and yeah, I, I think being able to have big public failure and yet carry on in the same way and not let that affect you emotionally, um, I think that's that's probably one of the biggest factors. Mattia, what do you think some of the qualities that you need to kind of succeed at top level sport are? Yeah, if we also agree with, with Jenny, I think like failure is part of the everyday and when you take into consideration then you have to challenge yourself. I mean like every three days when you have to play in front of million people, so sometimes you win but sometimes you lose. But I would say like sometimes what we have the tendency to, to forget is in sport, I mean mental is probably 70% of, of, uh, of, the, of the matrix. And um, I like to you know, make parallels between like uh, special forces, between athletes, because the reality is like where everybody stops, 
we keep going. I mean, if you ask me, I don't think in a, in a 20 years period, I woke up one day without feeling pain somewhere. So you have to constantly, you know, like push your limits and keep going and see something which not necessarily express, you know, like or experience when you're having like maybe a more, I would say maybe a more, more comfortable or a more normal life, you know. So this is something which is for us extremely important, the mental aspect where every day you have to challenge yourself, where every day you have to push the limits. Yeah, that's kind of athlete mindset. You, you just have to get up and do it again, even when you've had maybe one of those public failures or you've had a day where you've kind of experienced pain. That must, that must teach you resilience. Definitely, yeah. And I think that the sort of emotional roller coaster is, is, is a funny one. I mean, so I played sevens where you play six games in two days. So you can have, you know, this huge win and then in a few hours you're playing again and it's a loss. Um, so you kind of learn this, this sort of emotional um, just... Yeah, just, just not letting yourself get too high or too low. I think routine plays a big part in that. So between the games, doing everything in exactly the same way, not letting yourself come in and celebrate after big wins or come in and, you know, chuck, a, chuck the water bottles around when you lose. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just, just emotionally parking things, um, which is funny because then when you have these big wins, sometimes it takes two, three weeks to, to suddenly think, wow, <laughs> thinking back to what, what you achieved. Um, but, yeah, de definitely resilience, but I think... You can create resilience through, through being, having been through the highs and lows in the past, but then I think routine is, is a big part of that. Yeah. Mathieu, what are some of the ways that you dealt with setbacks in your athlete career? I mean, for me, one of the, the most difficult times when you're an athlete is when you get injured. And uh, I mean, like maybe everybody is focusing on a cure, but us as athletes, we focus mainly on prevention because uh, the, the main aspect is like we want to avoid to get to the cure, meaning like we have to be out of the beach, meaning we cannot perform. So the prevention is probably one of the most important aspects. And uh, I remember, I mean, like a time in Italy where I got an ACL, so I injured my knee and uh, my ligament, and I had to be out of the beach for more than, uh, more than six months. So again, I mean, like this is a difficult time and you have to face it and you have to move forward. And personally, how I managed to, to escape was to basically like uh, spend my energy obviously like on top of like the recovery and like doing everything possible to come back as soon as possible on the pitch. But I managed to take my mind away and by focusing on, on something else, which uh, has been like also a motor of my life for quite some time, which is like the biochemical company I'm leading today. And how about kind of preparing for those high stakes moments? You know, you're going out, you're about to play a really big game. How did you get yourself in the mindset to do that? For me, that's, that's about preparation. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, when I go out and play, I mean, I'm, whether it's a sort of flow state or I don't really think too much when I'm on the pitch um, because, it, because I've got that preparation part right, I think. Um, maybe that's another part of, of the sort of athlete mindset and, and the, the, the athletes that are at that level um, are normally the ones who, like Matthew said, take that, take that recovery seriously and, and preparation seriously, um, you know, physically, mentally getting ready. And then when you go out to play, it's not really about these pressure moments that you step up in. It's about being ready and just doing, doing your job, doing, doing what you've done every day for the, for the past however many years. So yeah, yeah those pressure moments, it, it's, it's not this sort of hero thing that you step up to. It's all about having done it before. Yeah. And I assume that all these are very kind of valuable qualities for entrepreneurs um, and advocates as well. The climate crisis is a kind of high stakes moment for humanity. And so obviously some of the lessons you've both learned in your careers are useful to what you do now. Uh, Mathieu, I'll come to you first. How did the lessons that you learned in Top Flight Football help you as the CEO of a biochemicals company? In like many aspects. I think uh, if uh, I'm able to today being a CEO of a biochemical company, I performed it like more than 12 years ago, it's probably because of the learning which I've experienced in sport in many aspects. I mean, the first one that come to my mind is like performing under pressure. You know, when you have to play in stadium uh, where you have uh, 80,000 people and many more on TV, I mean, like not only you have to, to deal with stress, but you have to be performing because the reality in sport you cannot hide. When you're an entrepreneur, I mean, you have the same type of stress. I mean, like you're onboarding sometimes your family, you are having a lot of people working for you and those people believe in you, you cannot let them down. So performing in the pressure is one aspect. Second aspect is what Jamie is saying, like dedication, hard work, preparation. I mean, again, this is part of your everyday and you have to commit to 100%. So resilience is also very important. This is something you're also experiencing as an entrepreneur. I don't think there is one entrepreneur who will tell you that yeah, succeeded without putting like total effort. Then we can speak also about team, teamwork, team spirit. 
I was part of a, of a team of, of 25 and 11 on the pitch and uh, the individuality will always come after the collective. So teamwork is very important, being able to inspire and at the same time being able to listen to others. Same thing, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and when you build your company, you know, you're part of a team, you have to be able to inspire your, 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 your colleagues and at the same time you have to be also like to listen to what they have to say. So many, many aspects which you find, you know, as an athlete, which you can basically transfer as an entrepreneur. And did you did it help you kind of not miss football as much when you when you made that transition? You know, it's a big part of your life for a long time, and then you're not doing it anymore. Did that, did it help with that transition? I mean, this is a, this is a funny question because today, if you ask me what do I miss the most, I mean, it's probably not kicking the ball, but it's probably the collective. You know, yeah. being part of a world pack, being able to to be part of a team who shares the same objective, uh, the same vision and to also like perform at the highest level. I mean, so for me, this is a collective I'm missing the most. And this is what I'm trying to recreate very hard, you know, like in my new life of an entrepreneur. I like to tell the team, you know, we have to build a commando team in order to be efficient and, and to focus on the win because as an entrepreneur, but more importantly, as an athlete, I mean, we are competitors. We are competitors. We love to win and we hate to lose. And uh, this is also something which I'm trying to transfer, you know, in a company mindset and in the value of the company. What about you, Jamie? How do you think that sport has kind of helped you in the next stage of your career? Do you want to talk a bit about kind of what you do now? Yeah, sure. Um, so so with, the, with my study at the moment, I, I got into um, the sort of sport and sustainability space. I was, I was interested in business sustainability first. Um, and in my undergraduate, sort of was reading around that and thought, right, this is what I'll do after rugby. Um, and after graduating was when I sort of put the two together. Um, and initially was interested in what a sustainable sports event, what a sustainable sports stadium looked like, and still very much am interested in that. But um, through this master's and, and my studies now, I'm getting really interested in, in fan engagement. Um, so taking, um, you know, getting to net zero as, as one solution to the climate crisis. Now it's, it's very carbon focused and there's a lot more we need to, to, to include biodiversity and, and extinction and, and social issues. But looking at net zero as, as one solution, the last little bit is, is very much behavioral. So technology and policy will get us so far, but there's a, a House of Lords report, for example, it, it says that 32% of getting to net zero is getting society to, to act differently. Um, and, you know, it depends on how they purchase. The Scottish Government has a similar report. It was 60% of net zero requires some sort of societal change. For me, governments and politicians, they're not going to be the ones that influence society to change. So what I'm interested in these, is these social collectives within society that you can influence with, with opinion leaders. And sport is, is the, biggest, the biggest collective for me. Uh, well, I mean, there's an MIT piece of data that says um, global influence in society, 49% is, is sports people, sports organizations. So what I'm interested in is how we can use sports, um, so athletes, um, teams, stadiums, to create this more sort of landscape level mindset shift um, so that these innovations that, that we need people to uptake, um, you know, picking out an example, say, say we need people to install heat pumps um, to, to, in order to get to net zero. I don't think it's going to be government saying, you know, you, we need to install heat pumps for this reason and this reason. For me, it's more a sort of landscape mindset shift and if we get athletes installing them and, and stadiums installing them and talking about the why the sort of the the, the environmental reasons um and, and and you know creating that that norm i think that's how you create change rather than focusing on the sort of individual aspect um, yeah so yeah that, that's where research is going and um, I'm, I'm sort of designing a study at the moment that will look a bit into that that's really interesting. You said quite a lot of interesting things there that I'll want to pick you up on. But um, Matty, I wanted to speak to you a bit about the idea that athletes can influence people, which is what Jamie's just said. And I wonder if anyone's ever said to you, footballers should sort of stay in their lane. They shouldn't be doing things outside the sporting field. Has anyone ever kind of come to you with, with an opinion like that? And what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I'm sure Jamie has heard it also. I mean, like, those are the classical things which... I would say we used to hear, I mean, for many years, I mean, probably like a few years in the past, I think things are, are evolving a lot. Uh, I think also a lot of athletes standing up for causes which are close to the heart. And, and I think it's obsolete, you know, like saying that an athlete should be uh, keeping the ball and should not have an opinion. I mean, the reality is like those days, athletes are having a social responsibility. I mean, we see also through social media, I mean, those athletes are having millions of followers and those followers are our kids and our next generation. So 
they have the right to basically drive positive change and have a positive, a positive influence you know, on those followers. And I also believe that if you have a topic or a cause which is close to your heart, where you also feel knowledgeable about it, then you have the right to stand up for it and, and talk about it. So, I mean, for me, it's totally normal those days and athlete like other, like, uh, such as politics or like, you know, other industries are coming up for causes which they care about. What do you think about that, Jamie? Do you ever get people kind of saying, what could you possibly know about, about this, you're a rugby player? Yeah, um, look, there's, there's, there's two barriers as an athlete to speaking out. Um, the first is hypocrisy. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a rugby sevens player. I fly around the world to play in tournaments and here I am speaking about climate. Um, and the second is not knowing enough. Um, so they're two, you know, in terms of getting other athletes to speak out, they're, they're two pretty big hurdles to, to get over. I, I certainly, you know, when I first started speaking publicly, it was, it's difficult to do. Um, but I think, and, and more and more now, there are these great organizations of athletes that are stepping out and speaking about these issues. Um, and, you know, it's really positively received. So I think the more that we get these advocates that are stepping forward, the more other athletes will start. Because, you know, from my conversations around the dinner table, athletes do care about these things. They yeah. want to speak about them. Um, and I think, yeah, we're, we're getting there towards removing them and, and, and using this, this platform for, for good. Yeah, and I think if you're going to kind of drive social change, you need to believe in the power of everyone to do good rather than say that people have to stay in their silos and they can only do kind of one thing. Um, in terms of uh, the technology you're working in, Mattia, can you tell us a bit more about GF Biochemicals and what you're doing? Yes, of course. I mean, if you don't mind, maybe I'll take a step back. And uh, I think we all recognize today that we're not talking anymore about global warming, but global boiling, like uh, Mr. Guterres uh, has mentioned uh, not so long ago. So um, on our side, we are addressing like uh, an industry which is called the, the petrochemical industry. I mean, I'm not sure if you are aware of this industry, but Every day we are using consumer goods. Those consumer goods are made of ingredients, and most of those ingredients until today are made of derivatives coming from oil, meaning from shampoo to deodorant to shower gel. All those products are made of ingredients and formulations which are derivatives of oil. So what we have developed like since 12 years ago, so co-founded the company at the time when I was still playing for AC Milan, what we developed is ingredients which are plant-based ingredients coming from agriculture, agriculture waste in order to replace those ingredients coming from the oil industry. And what we're trying to do is to deliver, I mean, like consumer goods which are safer and more sustainable. So I've been trying to work on that project for quite some, some time now, and uh, we are basically at commercial scale, and we're trying to have like uh, a global impact. And how did you begin the business? How did it start? How did it, sorry? How did it start? How did you come up with the idea? I think, um, as I was saying, I grew up by the sea, you know, in Marseille, and um, I mean, like, I had a one love, which was about football, and as I said, I was a privileged person to, to live on that passion for such a long time, and uh, on the other side, I had a father, which was uh, a diver by passion, so, so from a very early age, you know, collect of plastic on the beach for long hours, and um, obviously, like, uh, growing up, you know, in this environment where I was very much aware of the impact of humankind on, on nature at one point in life. I wanted to challenge myself a little bit intellectually, and that's why I decided to go in that direction. And what are your ambitions for the business? Where do you think you can go? This is a really good question because as an entrepreneur, I mean, we don't really know where we will be next week, but obviously, personally, like, I would like one day to have, you know, Jeff Bio to be the intel inside of the biomaterials because uh, slowly, slowly, people are starting to understand that a product is not only about the packaging, but it's also about the, the formulation and what is inside because, you know, every day we are using all those products which we apply, I mean, on our skin, on our hair, I mean, in our house. And the reality is like, it's more important than just the packaging, but also the formulation. So, I mean, personally, I like one day to, to be considered the intel inside of the biomaterial and, and making, you know, safer and more sustainable product at, at large scale because that can have a, a direct impact on, on the health of the people and basically on the health of the planet also. And Jamie, what work do you think you can do? How do you hope to kind of build in this space? Uh, I'm hoping that my work um, sort of highlights just the platform that sport has. I think sport's very good at, you know, it recognizes its platform and I think it's very good at commercializing it. Um, but I think, you know, hopefully it realizes that it can be used to, to, you know, to, to promote the things that we need to promote. You know, there's, there's already examples of social issues that, that sport has, has taken a stance on and, um, you know, starts really, really positive conversations. I think there's more that needs to be done in the environmental space. Um, 
in terms of where I where I'd like to go. Um, I've still got another year of playing. I'm I'm hoping to to play in the Paris Olympics, um, and I think after that will will be the time to sort of move away and. Um, yeah, we're seeing more and more of these sort of sustainability roles within sports. So um, hopefully there's a platform there. Um, like I said, to, you know, from, from the start in terms of actually working towards decarbonizing events and, and, um, and um, stadiums, um, but also progressing this, this fan engagement work. Um, I think sport has this role in the, in the coming years to be a trusted messenger for governments. So, you know, we, we know where we need to get to, we know we need to influence change. I think sport has a role there to, to, to step in that it's not really using at the moment. Absolutely. Um, and what advice do you have for someone who would kind of like to be involved? Uh, good question. Um, for me, when I started sort of, like I said, I, I sort of put this sport and sustainability together. I just listen to as many podcasts as I could and, and read as many articles as I could, but I also reached out to, to the sort of individuals in the, in the sort of sector that were sort of, I suppose, thought leading at the, at the time and, well, and still are, um, and had such a positive response. You know, reaching out on LinkedIn and, and, you know, the next week we're on Zoom chatting away. So I think reading and listening, but just reaching out to people and, and asking for a bit of time. Um, I think it's such a collaborative space, the sort of sustainability space. Everyone's working towards this massive goal. It has to be collaborative um, and everyone's very willing to, to share thoughts, to share advice. Um, so I think reaching out would probably be the, the, the number one piece of advice. Do you have teammates reaching out to you and asking how they can be better? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, there are these great organizations now. That there's, there's a couple, there's um, Athletes for the World and High Impact Athletes. So there, there are some organizations that are being created for athletes that are, you know, wanting to get into space and want a bit of advice. It, you know, makes it much easier if you speak to someone that's, that's done it. Um, uh, so I think that's, yeah, definitely the community aspect helps. Um, yeah. Yeah. Matteo, about you, what advice do you have for people who, who want to kind of make a change, whether that's an athlete or a person? <laughs> it's difficult to obviously give advice, but maybe, I mean, like quote, uh, one of my ex-presidents at the time in AC Milan, Silvio Berlusconi, who used to tell us guys, if you want to achieve big things, you need to have big dreams. Or maybe just to tell, to tell people out there, don't take no for an answer. I mean, you have the right to, to dream big and, and, and you can make it. I mean, I think athletes were the perfect example. You know, like we are, I mean, like normal people and uh, we had a dream and we worked very hard for it and, and we made it happen. So this is one, the message one I want to push, you know, which is like believe in your dream and anything is possible. Don't take no for an answer. And maybe just to finish, um, life is sometimes a paradox. I remember going to school and there was two subjects which I couldn't stand was English. <laughs> because I was, I don't know why, don't ask me why, but I was scared of speaking English, I didn't want to speak English, and now this is 19 years old, you know, like, I'm speaking English and, and my mind is operating in English uh, more than in French. And the second aspect is, I hated chemistry in school, and I'm running a biochemical company. So, <laughs> you know, life is a paradox and everything is possible, and this is very much the message I, I, I want to, to push out there. And are there any other businesses that you really admire in this space, that can people who are doing amazing things? I mean, plenty. I think, like, uh, obviously, we're going, you know, like a difficult time in the tech industry because, you know, for many, many years we have been looking at, uh, we have been looking at growth instead of profitability. But I think some people are doing amazing work, you know, on on health, on sustainability. It's hard to pick one uh, one one business in particular, but I mean, like, you have believers out there trying to drive change, and um, and and I'm pleased, you know, to to also be part of this industry, which is trying to build like a, a better place. What about you? Are there any anyone doing things you admire apart from the kind of athlete organisations that you've mentioned? Um, I think, I mean, Patagonia is always an example that's used, um, but I think rightly so. Um, there's a lot of businesses now that are doing sustainable action when it's a win-win, you know, when it makes financial sense and it's good for the planet and they love to speak about it. Yeah. And that's great, of course, but I think Patagonia really in, embody a business that, that do it when it doesn't make financial sense. I mean, um, I think Sustainable Cotton was the example. They moved on to Sustainable Cotton way before it was financially viable, but they did it because it was the right thing to do and it led the industry. And now there's, there's a lot more Sustainable Cotton in the industry. So, um, yeah, I, th I think going beyond that, that win-win is the difficult part for, for 
you know many businesses um, and yeah definitely respect Patagonia for taking the stance of, of doing what's right for the world. And what are the other things you think we need to kind of overcome because in theory it's such a no-brainer like of course we should all be doing things to help the planet it's the planet we all live on and we want it to be kind of there in 10 20 years time and longer what do you think some of the other challenges are kind of convincing people to really care about this stuff? I think one of the big issues with with climate change because it's such a big complex almost ambiguous thing. Um, people's mindsets are so um, created by what's around them. Like I talked about that landscape level, that the mindsets, norms, um, you know, this, this is a tech summit. Everyone will be well aware of, of misinformation and disinformation. And, you know, people are guided by these sort of social media bubbles and, and your, your perceptions um, are guided by, by, you know, your peers around you. So I think one of the issues with the climate crisis is that it's not down to science and facts and figures to sort of win over and, and show the right direction because you can give the same facts and figures to, to, to two different people and they perceive them in different ways. So, yeah, probably the biggest challenge is getting to that landscape level um, shifting the mindset, shifting the norm. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's where sport potentially has, um, you know, a, a part to play. What do you think, Mathieu? What are some of the challenges of kind of convincing people to ditch forever chemicals in their life, for example? I mean, the first thing we have to, to do is like to put even more pressure on, on government, government yeah. and big, uh, big corporations. Because I think, like at the end of the day, I mean, um, big corporations. I mean, if they are creating the problem, they need to also bring solution. Too many times we are trying to basically bring back the problem on on people. Obviously, people are also part of the solution, and we need to empower people to make better choice. I fully agree. But I think governments need to act and to basically like act today and, and not to go. I mean, this is one of the important aspects. The second aspect, I think, we need to bring the uh, breakdown. I mean, the issue of climate change, so people can understand that small changes together can have a massive impact, okay? Because the reality, whether you care about the planet or not, I hope everybody care about his own health. And the reality, we cannot escape. If you take pollution, we all live in a big city. So even if you don't care about the planet, you cannot accept, ex escape the pollution in the city. I mean, like, same for plastic. If you take plastic, I mean, most of people are eating fish. You know, like, today you have studies showing that microplastics are being found, you know, like in newborn. So the reality is like we're all being impacted and whether we care or not about, you know, like the planet, I mean, we have to change. So I think creating messages which are more digestible for people, breaking down, you know, like the topic is very important and empowering people also. So as Jenny was saying, I think ports is one of the vehicles which we can leverage in order to create awareness. Creating awareness is important because it helps people making a better choice. Yeah, I think those small changes are really important, kind of showing people that they can be part of the, be a kind of difference maker. Um, what message do you want people to kind of take away from this talk then? I think the fact that sport has, has a platform, but also has a responsibility. Um, and yeah, that, that's, yeah, the message is that the, the next 10 years, sport should, should start to use it. Um, and there are some, there's some movement in the right direction, but yeah, there's a, there's a long way to go. What about you, Matteo? What kind of messages do you want to, people to go away with today? And just to say that we all have a, a responsibility towards the next generation and also like for everybody to realize that everyone has, can have an impact, you know, like at a different level, but everybody can have an impact and, and you know, putting all those small changes together can have like a massive, a, a massive change on a global scale. So just to be able for people to realize that they are part of the solution. Absolutely. I think we're almost running out of time. Um, but thank you so much for, to both of you for being here and telling me a bit more about how the kind of athlete mindset can be useful in confronting one of the biggest problems that humanity has to face. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.